I'm also excited this morning to be able to chime in on your series. So we have, we've been working through um, 1st and 2nd Samuel, and uh, we've been going through it quite slowly. Um, so I had to go back quite a ways in my notes to get to 1st Samuel chapter 8. Um, I think this morning um, we are covering 2nd Samuel uh, 16. So we're nearing the end of our series and it has just been a tremendous series um, for our church. So uh, when I heard this is where you guys are at, um, just love that I could maybe maybe preach into your series and not uh, take a week off. Um, so keep you, keep you moving along in your series. So, um, you know, a, a little bit of review is, you know, things have been rough for Israel, you could say. Um, the Philistines have defeated them. The Ark has been captured. This is just completely devastating. When that took place, uh, I, I know you know, you, you heard this already from Alan, but Eli fell over and died at the news of that. His sons have died as well. Um, one of his son's wives is having a baby, and before she dies in childbirth, she names her child Ichabod. The glory has departed. It's not a good day in Israel. Uh, and she named him that because the ark had been captured. Um, it then sat in what looks to, appears to be in submission to the Philistine god, Dagon. God's people are utterly defeated. There are at least three beheadings in the books of First and Second Samuel. The first one you already heard about is when David beheads the giant, Goliath. Uh, the second is when God beheads the Philistine god of Dagon. And as they think the ark, the Israelites' god sits in submission to them. Well, God actually beheads the god of the Philistines. And uh, at that point, the Philistines begin to play hot potato um, with the ark. Let's get rid of this. Uh, and all of that. And then in chapter 7, verses 1 through 3, the ark is now housed at uh, Adinabad's, and the people begin to lament. And 20 years go by. So we just turn the page, right? But 20 years go by. And Samuel calls them to repentance back in chapter 7. It says, verse 3, And Samuel said to all the house of Israel, If you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtoreth uh, from among you and direct your heart to the Lord and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hands of the Philistines. So the people of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtoreth, and they serve the Lord only. That's chapter 7. I'm going to preach chapter 8. It's a little bit of a different picture. Chapter 7, the people are repenting, the people are lamenting, and they return to the Lord. Turn the page, chapter 8, they reject the Lord's reign, and they demand a king. They are, in essence, saying, we need you, God, chapter 7. We're grateful for you, chapter 7, chapter 8, but we need more than you. We need another king. We need a king like the other nations. How many of you have ever been skydiving? Anybody jumped out of an airplane? Really? You need to come to Florida. All right, you need to come to Titusville. It's really, it's a destination for skydiving. And so about seven, eight years ago, my wife and I, we jumped out of that plane, right? And so, you know, they say that, you know, why would you jump out of a perfectly good airplane, right? Um, well, the scariest part of skydiving for me was not jumping. It was the it was the plane trip up because it takes so long and you just circle as you get higher and higher and higher. And so you're strapped, you've got, you, you do a, 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 what do you call it? You got to jump with another guy who's experienced on your back. That's what, that's what it is. And so you're strapped to a guy who's done this and certified to do this. And, you know, you just met him. You just met this guy five minutes ago. 
And so, um, you know, it just, you're looking out the window, a guy strapped to your back, it's very uncomfortable, the plane is noisy, a lot, of, a lot of people, meaning about eight, nine people are about ready to jump, they also have someone strapped to their back, and uh, it's just taking so long to get up high enough. And the the thing is about that is it's not that you would jump out of a perfectly good airplane. It's who is this guy that you're strapped to, right? Who's the stranger? And so at one point, as we're going higher and higher and higher, and I think we were jumping at about 12,000 feet, I said to him, hey, and you have to yell pretty loud because it's noisy in this little shell of an airplane, "Um, how high are we? At which point he yells back at me, um, I'm high as a kite. How high are you? <laughs> you have to trust this stranger. And there's a whole lot of things that at that moment you begin to realize that you don't know about this guy. Forget the good plane that you're jumping out of. Who is this guy? What, what was his night like last night? All right, with a comment like that. Um, that, that, uh, that stranger... Uh, you need to trust him. And if you ever watch like parachuting fails, um, it usually comes when the person like me is terrified and wants to take control. That's not your job. (laughs) That's his job. He's got control. And they have these things that they, they reach for and they can control that parachute and do circles or dive down or do a number of different things. Um, People who want control want to grab those controls and that's not our job. You're just, your job is to just trust the guy who's strapped to your back. Your job is to just put your hands out and fall <laughs> to the earth and trust that he's got this. Okay, well, that guy, he doesn't need your help. He doesn't want your help. And uh, that's actually not going to be helpful to grab the controls. And that's Israel. They know they have God strapped to their back, but that's not good enough for them, okay? Chapter 8 is a picture of them struggling to grab on to the controls, the ropes. And in doing so, they're not trusting the Lord. All right, well, we're going to pause and pray, and we're going to dive into this text, chapter 8. Lord, I just pray that you would encourage, bless, build your church this morning through the preaching of your word. Lord, use it for your kingdom, for the advancement of your kingdom. Lord, to encourage our hearts, your bride, the church, that you so love. Bless each one this morning as we preach your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, well, uh, if your Bibles aren't open, you can open to 1 Samuel chapter 8. And I'm going to read the first five, five verses there. We'll read portions of chapter 8. We'll see how many we get through. But um, beginning in verse 1 there. When Samuel became old... He made his sons judges over Israel. The name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah, and they were judges in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not walk in the ways, in his ways, but turned aside after gain. They took bribes, perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Behold, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. All right, a couple key things that are going on there. Point number one this morning, in the days of uncertainty, where do we turn? This is days of uncertainty for Israel. Samuel has been a godsend to the people of God. He's a man of faith, a man of character. He is wise, and he's been a source to the people of stability, all right, in their life. The land has been returned to Israel during his era. The people have been repenting. Samuel is mediating on their behalf. And then chapter 8, verse number 1, when Samuel became old. Can I translate that for us? When things became uncertain. When our guy, we can all, we, we can all tell, okay, our guy is getting old and, and his days are now more obviously numbered. When things became uncertain, when things became unsettled, when we didn't know where things were headed, we needed to grab the ropes. We needed to sure things up in the uncertainty. We need to take control. And I want to ask us, where do you turn 
in your uncertainty. It's amazing how quickly our lives can go from chapter 7 to chapter 8. Repenting and returning to the Lord to grab the ropes. I can't trust you. I've got to take control here. We're familiar, aren't we, with uncertainty. It's not that long ago, right, where we rolled from 2019 into 2020 and we met the year that would be like none other. Believers and unbelievers alike didn't trust who they were strapped to. And they began to grab the ropes. And that's when we saw just in our culture and society just the unraveling that took place. Things have now settled down, but to just encourage you, there will be new uncertainties in 2023. I hope you feel my encouragement. Uncertainty is a certain thing because you and I are not sovereign. That's verse number one. What are we going to do? We don't know where things are headed, and it feels very unsettling, and there's going to be a leadership gap in Israel. Samuel is old. Kids are bad. Philistines are in check, but they're still lurking out there, and they want to destroy us. Does any of this sound like our lives? The level of uncertainty over the past years reached new levels. Pastors resigned. Church members left. Grabbed the ropes. And the Israelites went from repentance in chapter 7 to chapter 8. Give us a king. And they did that seemingly overnight. In the leadership uncertainty, dumb things get suggested and followed. That happens in churches all the time. In the absence of a leader, churches have hopped onto every imaginable wind of doctrine, every pragmatic approach to how to build a church. In the uncertainty, let's bail on God and turn to the world's wisdom and get us a king to sure some things up. Trust in our methods rather than God himself. Trust in man's wisdom rather than in God's word. Trust in man's leadership rather than in Christ who builds his church. So as we continue through this chapter, chapter 8, we all need to be asking ourselves, in the day of uncertainty, where do we turn? Secondly, in the day of uncertainty, we must turn to the king's word rather than to the kings of the world. All right, we'll pick up here in verse number 5. And said to him, Behold, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. See, here's what they don't realize. They already have a king. That king's not good enough. We can't trust that king. We need to look like the other nations. For us today, we need to look like the world. We need to find, we need to grab the ropes. Verse 8, according to all the deeds they have done from the day I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice, only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. Wow, okay, so verse number 6, Samuel is praying. He turns to the Lord in this moment. And we need verse 6, don't we? We need, we need this verse where the leader turns to the Lord. But here's, there's something missing in verse 6. It's great that Samuel's turning to the Lord in prayer. But the only one praying in verse 6, the only one praying in chapter 8 is Samuel. Why is he the only one praying? Where's the prayer meeting? Where's, where's the verse that says, having repented and direct, turned their hearts to the Lord, chapter 7, the people then came together and sought the Lord, chapter 8. The people gathered in fasting and prayer. There, there's no such verse in chapter 8. Only Samuel. Well, the Lord tells Samuel to, two things. Warn them, well, obey them. Give them what they want and warn them. Obey them and warn them. Uh, He says in verse 7, and and basically he says, this has been been Israel's history, verse 8. This this has been the history prior to you, Samuel. God's people again and again and again reject him. And they are unfaithful. God has been their king. 
but they reject him at every turn. And God says to Samuel, give them what they want. Secondly, he warns them in verse number 10. And can I just say to us how kind it is of the Lord that we have the Old Testament. Love your Bible. Love all of it. Love your Old Testament. Friends, the, this is the story of the Bible. It's a warning to human foolishness that lives in all of us. We've got the Old Testament, the New Testament tells us, to instruct us away from the foolishness of what we read here. So we can read this and go, ah, Let's, let's, let's call the prayer meeting instead of call for a new king. Perhaps you're here today and you know you've been rejecting his wisdom. Perhaps you've been rejecting the Lord's rule and reign in your life. Perhaps you've wanted another king. Perhaps you've wanted a king like the world's kings. You heard Alan preach about it last week, idols, idols. Kings of wealth and sex and power and beauty and recognition and respect and whatever you fill in the blank. Give me something to grab on to so I can have a sense of control because I want to be sovereign. See, there are two ways to reject God. The first way is some say, I don't want God in my life. No thanks. I'm not interested. I reject you. The second is others who say, God, you're welcome in my life. But I'm sure you'll also understand, Lord, that I need some insur an insurance policy here. I know that you're Emmanuel, God with us. And that's really great. But just in case if something really goes wrong, I'm sure you understand, Lord, I need more than just you. You understand, right? I just don't feel I can trust you fully. I need a king here. And now, you see, the problem wasn't that they asked for a king. The problem was that they rejected the king they already had. A few examples. Why am I so anxious? Is it not because I am uncertain that the king has got this? Give me a king. Maybe that's a cry for world peace. Maybe that's a cry for financial stability. Maybe that's a cry for a better government. Give me a king. To this, Jesus says, Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. What will you eat or what will you drink, nor about your body? What you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. And you not of, are you not of more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Boy, we try. Why am I depressed? Is my depression a form of grief that the king's plan is not the best one? I've got a better plan. I am a better sovereign. Grab the ropes. I'm depressed. <laughs> it's not working out. Give me a king because I don't like how my life is working out and life is spinning out of my control. I'm depressed because I don't like his sovereign rule at this time in my life. To this, Paul says to the Romans, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Why do I fear? Is it not that there are uncertainties lurking around the corner? I mean, the Philistines are out there. They want to destroy us. Uncertainties beyond my control. What will happen with my job? What will happen with my health, my marriage, my children, my church? You fill in the blank. Isaiah 41 says, But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its farthest corners, saying to you, You are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Now, I don't mean to oversimplify anxiety, fear, or depression. There can be chemical imbalances. There can be poor diets. There can be a lack of sleep. 
There can be a number of other things, but let's also not just jump over. There might just be a need to repent, to run to the Lord in repentance. That feeling of fear might be God's means to reveal to us that we need to do some heart work and we genuinely need to trust the Lord. So let's be honest. We reach for the ropes. We want control. God, I'm glad you're strapped to my back and all as I free fall to the earth, but you're not enough. I need more than you. Give me a king. Give me some security. Give me some assurance. I need more than just you. That was Israel. Well, God gave them what they were lusting for. Give us a king like the other nations, a king who looks like a king. You'll find, and you probably already have in your study of Samuel, looks are important in Samuel. Like, they're going to take Saul because Saul looks the part. <laughs> and you'll, you just read over and over again, he's a, he's a head taller. He's, a, oh man, he's a looker. Like, this guy is tall and kingly. Give us that guy because he looks like a king. You understand, don't you, Lord? All these nations have their guy, somebody who can lead them. Incredibly, they felt they were at a disadvantage to the other nations. That's what they were saying in their hearts when they were asking for a king. Be reminded they live under the shadow of Deuteronomy and Exodus and Joshua, things like Deuteronomy 31, the Lord your God himself will go before you he will destroy these nations before you be strong and courageous do not fear or be in dread of them for it is the Lord your God who goes with you he will not leave you or forsake you and they're saying that's all well and good but give us a king so we can be like them thirdly in the days of uncertainty rejecting the king to then embrace a king will bring consequences. This is verses 11 through 17. I'm going to let, allow you to read that on your own, in your own time, perhaps later today. But hear me, if you make beauty your king, well, beauty fades. If you make marriage your king, well, marriages will fail. They will fail you. They, 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 they don't make for good kings. If you make government your king, I mean, Right? If you make X side of the aisle, politically speaking, your king. If you make the Republican Party, if you make the Constitution. Friends, I'm a, I'm a conservative, politically speaking, but if I make that my king, if that's my source of hope, if that's where I place my trust, then consequences will follow. Heartache will follow. Now, no one in the room right now is saying, yep, that's me. I'm making that my king. And I just want to confess that to everybody this morning. Let me present it to us like this. Are you anxious? Are you stressed? Are you afraid about your government today? What are we saying? We're saying, if my guy was in there, then I would be at peace. Is the king you've made the government to be not giving you what you want it to give you? Friends, we have 1 Samuel 8 for our benefit that we too might repent. The sovereign king, their God, our God, is sometimes too small of a sovereign in our eyes. He's just not quite that sovereign to take care or for us to trust. He's got this. We want to grab the ropes. He's a weak and limited sovereign. Now we know... We, we can pass the test better than that, right? Like if you take out the paper and... We know the answers to the test, but when uncertainties come our way, 
our hearts are exposed as to what we truly, truly believe about the Lord. We can be just like them and we can begin to cry out, we need a king, we need an answer here. Except we say things like, we need a president. We say things like, we need to return to the Constitution. Again, please hear me. I love the Constitution. I think it's a pretty amazing document, all right? So, or we might say, we need to put prayer back. And so if we just put prayer, that's when everything fell apart, when we put prayer out of the schools. And I'm for that. Please hear me. I'm for that. But why would we do that when our churches have little prayer in the church? Just putting prayer back in the school can be, can be a desire for another king. I am an American. <laughs> I love this country. But I'm more than American. I'm a Christian. That's my first and foremost identity. I am in Christ. My citizenship, you, as a follower of Christ, your first and foremost citizenship is not in this life, it's preserved in heaven for you, First Peter 1. You have a higher calling, a higher citizenship. I believe in a monarchy. I love monarchy where Jesus is king, king of all kings. Friends, our greatest need today is not this president or that president. Our greatest need today is the sovereign king of all kings. Our greatest need today, as much as I love the document, is not a return to the Constitution. Our greatest need is a return to the Word of God. We are citizens of another kingdom, another king. So we join with Samuel here. We, we don't leave Samuel alone. We join with them in prayer, calling out to the sovereign God, our king, of kings when we pray. Over the years, each of our children has come to Kim and I, my wife and I, and said something like, ah, you know, they kind of come a little bit sheepishly, but like, you know, kind of been thinking, kind of would like to maybe move out, you know? And it's almost like an apology and we've kind of walked them through. It's okay, it's okay. Like, we love you. We don't feel unloved by that desire to move out. That's not um, what you're communicating. Uh, but I'm ready, I want to get a place of my own. What do you guys think about that? And we've always kind of just leaned into the conversation. It's a good conversation to have. We're not afraid of the conversation. And we'll even communicate, actually, this is the way it's supposed to be. It's okay. Um, that's actually the plan. The plan is, that we have for you guys, since you were born, is to move out, okay? So while we're together, let's, let's, let's go, yeah. But we need to talk, and we need to pray, and we need to wisdom. We need to, we need to seek God's wisdom when that right time might be. You should want to move out. That's normal. That's the plan. But right now, you're nine years old, all right? And so not yet, not yet. Israel is supposed to have a king, okay? Just not yet. And definitely not like not yet and not like. Not yet, not like the other nations. You're going to have a unique king. Your king is going to be entirely different than the other nations. But I want to move out now. That's Israel. We're nine years old. We want to move out now. And I reject your wisdom. And I reject waiting on you. That was Abraham. That was Moses. That's Samuel chapter 8. That was the disciples. That has often been To the people living in the days of Samuel, chapter 8, the plan is that there will be a king whose name is Jesus. We've sunk about it. But we don't want to wait on him. We want a king now. We want to be like the other nations. So we grab the reins and we want control. And we reject, in doing so, the king as we embrace a king. When we, in essence, say, I don't fully reject you, God. I mean, I need you, but you're not enough. 
I'm not sure which is worse, the person who doesn't know God and outright rejects God and says, I have no need of you, or the person who knows God and says, yes, I need you, but you're not enough. Samuel then warns them of the consequences of their lust for um, their desire to have a king like the other nations. And so in verses 11 through 17, he tells it six different times. This is what the king's, he's gonna take from you. He's gonna take, he says, he's gonna take your sons to die in battle. And when not fighting to plow and to reap, he's gonna take your daughters. He's gonna take your fields and your orchards and your vineyards. He's gonna take your servants. He's gonna take a tithe. In summary, you'll be just like your ancestors. This is what you get to look forward to Israel who were living in slavery in Egypt. That's what you're asking for. Well, they want a king that they can control, but the king will actually control them. That's the warning. And that's the folly of sin. That's the folly of idolatry. We think that we can control sin, but sin controls us. And the kings we create turn their subjects into servants. We're not just talking about Saul here. Saul is gonna be a great example of all the things that he takes. But we're also talking about David. We're talking about David, the guy with a, with a heart after God. He will take someone's daughter. He will take someone's wife. He will have that husband killed. Many others will kill as a result of his desire to hide his sin. Well, his son, David's son, will also take his daughter and he will one-up his dad, David 2.0. You'll get there, 2 Samuel. That's where the kings, kings of our making will take us. The lie of the king is that it says, if you make me your king, you'll have comfort, you'll have peace, and we buy the lie, and the king laughs and mocks us. You actually thought that you could reject God and there would be no consequences to that foolishness. Thomas and Greer say, whatever you depend on for happiness and security, you become the slave of that thing. So Samuel warns them and the people respond, okay, great, we'll take them. We'll take them. Give us what they want. Let's read verse 19, the end of the chapter. But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel and they said, no, but there shall be a king over us that we also may be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. What a lie. And when Samuel had heard all the words of the people, he repeated them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, obey their voice and make them a king. Samuel then said to the men of Israel, go every man to his city. You don't want that response. When the king gave them what they wanted, you don't want the Lord to do that. There are some prayers that you have probably prayed. I know I have prayed that you don't want answered. You think you do. God, be the king over my life. I want you to override my stupid desires at times. What I think I so sovereignly see and know I need or desire. The things that I think are best for me. Don't, Lord, give me yes to all my requests. And when it's confusing, and when it's difficult, and when the answer to our prayers perhaps is no, help us to trust in you, Lord. You're the sovereign. They actually got what they were asking for. And it's not good. Do you have any unanswered prayers hanging out there? Pause and thank the Lord. so grateful for prayers he did not give me what I wanted well the Lord here gives them what they want so number five who's your king don't miss the gospel point there's a gracious irony to all of this because God remained king in spite of them God remained king even though they rejected his rule his faithful reign continued in spite of them. 
And the kings will have sons, and those sons will divide and tear the kingdom in two. Let's appoint a king. But in a surprising twist of grace, that will actually become the, their ultimate salvation. Because through the lines of the kings, there will be a king. Or how Isaiah puts it, out of the stump of Jesse, stump, will be a shoot. <laughs> That's Jesus. There will be life out of that stump. There will be a king. Don't miss the gospel point to Samuel 8. We do need a king. We absolutely need a king, one who will rule and reign, one who is for the people and does what he does to serve the people and care for the people, one who is not seeking to take for his own gain, that was the warning Samuel brought, but a king who will take the towel and wash his disciples' feet. A king. A king who will be tempted in every way and yet his rule will be without sin. Church, that's our king. God will give them Saul, and Saul will fail to fulfill his promises. David will follow, and even this godly man you know will fail miserably. But Christ, your king, will walk perfectly and will be the fulfillment of every single promise ever made. Saul will fail to obey God. Saul will fail to defeat the enemy. He will disobey God and not complete his task, his job. David will become so prosperous that he won't even go into battle. It reads something like, in the days when the kings would go to battle, David stays home. That's the introduction to his failure. Let's, let's, let's read it like this. In the days of prosperity, when things were so well in the kingdom and everything was going so well for David, he, he failed the test of prosperity. He did much better when he was running from Saul in the caves in adversity. But friends, don't miss the gospel point. Another king has come. Jesus Christ died on the cross crushing and destroying the enemy, which is sin and death. Saul started out well, and he ends up fizzling out. Christ started out well in Bethlehem, and he did what he said he would do. It is finished on that hill called Calvary. Saul's reign turned Israel into his servants, but a king will come not to be served, but to serve by laying down his life as a ransom. For many, Saul's sinful reign caused many to die. Christ's righteous reign caused his own death, which is why we now have life, new life, eternal life in him. We all have to choose our king. We have chapter eight for our benefit. Don't look at that Samuel eight self-righteously it is there, it exists for our instruction to help us. They rejected God. They will reject God again and cry out against the king as the crowd shouted, crucify him. We reject you. Their rejection of the king became our salvation by that king. God's plan for us was always a kingship. Welcome to the monarchy. Christ is not only your savior, he's your king. He's Lord, savior, king. So I close one month past Christmas, right? You probably read this during the Christmas season. It's worthy this morning of our attention as well. Isaiah 9, for to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. 
of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Praise be to our God. Father, we thank you so very much for your word, Lord. We thank you how reading of your word and and looking back uh, thousands of years ago, Lord, has so much for us today. Lord, this is no, this is no dead book. This is living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. Lord, I thank you for your church, your bride, your people that you are so lovingly, faithfully committed to. Lord, help us to turn our hearts, Lord, where we might be saying, God, I thank you, I need you, it's good to have you in my back pocket, but I need more than you. Lord, I pray that you would help us to turn to you and repent and call out to you, Lord, we we don't need more than you. you. You provide everything that we need in life and death. Lord, help us. We like to grab for the ropes. We want to be the sovereign one. We want to be in control. But Lord, remind us again and again that we can trust in you and in you alone. To your name we praise. Amen. God bless you, church.